Well, welcome to this week's Nebraska Soybean Board Weekly Market Roundup, which is, of course, brought to you by Nebraska Soybean Farmers and their checkoff. I'm Bryce Duskett this week, filling in for Susan Littlefield. As we take a look at the week's trade, it was a bit mixed. July corn finishing down while July soybeans up. We'll talk about that as well as the USDA World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates Report with the gentleman you can see on your screen now. We'll get back to them right after this message from the Nebraska Soybean Board. It may be small, but this little bean fuels a lot of power. It powers a food industry as a top source of protein. It's a fuel that powers diesel engines with fewer emissions. It powers a state economy and bottom lines. And it powers the rest of the world as a top Nebraska export. Yeah, it may be small, but we're finding more ways for this little bean to power Nebraska. Welcome back to the Weekly Market Roundup. As you see on the screen and here on the radio with us today is Brian Split and Jim McCormick, both from agmarket.net. Good day to you both, gentlemen, and thank you for joining us. Brian, let's turn to you first as we took a look at the week straight and kind of summarize things. First, maybe let's hit on the corn front and shift over to soybeans. What did you see in the week's trade? Yeah, you know, we had started the week uh, negative. We had a pretty good close last Friday for both July and December corn. Uh, to finish up the week, the July contract, I believe, was down four and three quarters of a cent, while the December contract was down about 11. Um, you know, the forecast for rain to come through this weekend and then with the uh, models continuing to keep rain and kind of the, uh, the extended forecast uh, that just continued to put pressure in the market. Uh, soybeans perform much better this week than corn. We did have the July contract up a little over 30 cents this week. I think about 34 with the November contract up about 20 on the week. And uh, there's some things kind of percolating under the surface on soybeans that uh, we'll, we'll talk about here later in the interview. Yeah, looking forward to getting into that. Of course, we can't uh, go much further than talking about USDA's World Agricultural Supply and Demand's Estimates report that, of course, came out on Friday. Jim, as we turn over to you, what did you see in that report? What, what were you keeping an eye on and what were some of the numbers you saw? Well, I think the big thing we're looking at, we're anticipating the government to essentially cut exports. The fact of the matter is demand just has not been there on the export market. And they actually, Bryce, essentially accomplish that. They cut corn exports by 50 million. They cut bean exports by 15 million bushels. They did offset the corn exports a little bit by cutting the import by about 15. But the net effect is uh, the carryout grew. And uh, unfortunately, that's what it, it was expected. Brian, it seems like when these reports come out, it's all about the surprise element and seeing if uh, USDA surprised the markets at all. Anything stick out for you when it came to that? No, I, th I think the surprise would have been if the USDA would have kind of broken uh, traditional protocol and chose to use the recent dryness uh, across the Corn Belt as a uh, impetus to, to reduce new crop yield. Uh, we have seen the USDA reduce yield before on the June report, but it's been due to delayed plantings, uh, which is not the case this year. Uh, yet we do have a, a newer group in the USDA as far as personnel. So uh, there's a thought maybe they'd go out on a limb and, and uh, do something they haven't done before. That was not the case. So they left all of the new crop balance sheets alone. Uh, and the only change to the new crop balance sheet just comes by way of old crop carry in. Uh, being increased for both corn and soybeans. So I really don't think there was any surprises on this report. Uh, the next one's going to be the June quarterly stocks and the planted acreage report. Uh, and that's definitely one that's uh, more well known for having some surprises in store. All right. Well, we kind of put a bow on the, the report there. Jim, we come back to you and ask you then, what are these markets going to be looking at as we uh, enter into the weekend here and perhaps see some rain? I think that's definitely what it is. I mean, the reality is the trade looks at two big weather models, the European weather model and the U.S. weather model. Now, the European weather model only goes out 10 days, Bryce. The, the American model goes out 16 days. And there's been a battle in general. The European model has been dry. The American model has been wet. As we came into the day, they both kind of agreed. Uh, we're going to be a little bit, there is rain coming in this weekend, uh, just not as much as maybe what we thought earlier in the week. What's going to be interesting, though, folks, is this is the first rain event we've had over the weekend where it's going to be raining. Now, like what I mean by that is over the holiday weekend last weekend, you know, the debate was would that rain show up eight, nine, ten days from now? Now this weekend is the first really rain event, and we're going to be watching here where we're at in northern Illinois. Does this rain come to uh, fruition? And if we do get rain, 
how much is that intensity at this point going to be? Because right now, uh, like Brian said, we got about 45 percent of the corn crop, roughly, I think, a little over 35, 40 percent of the bean crop is under drought category right now. So uh, we really need to see these uh, rains start to come. Yeah, you brought up uh, kind of where you guys are located and joining us, of course, myself here in Lincoln, Nebraska today. Again, give a quick update uh, on how the crop is looking there and that impact by drought. Are you seeing it as you drive across the countryside? You're definitely seeing stress in the crop in Illinois. Uh, we, our business partner, Matt Bennett Farms uh, in Windsor, Illinois, which is pretty close to Champaign. And so there's definitely concern about the ongoing dryness that we're seeing in Illinois as a whole. The crop conditions uh, that we had on Monday afternoon show the stress that's that uh, the Illinois corn crop is experiencing. Uh, and that may be something that uh, we'll see further deteriorate uh, on Monday's report. Of, of course, uh, the big uh, driver there is going to be whether or not some of the rain verifies over the weekend. Uh, and, and I also think that, that how this rain verifies or doesn't verify is then going to be, uh, I think as maybe Jim was alluding to, something that gets the trade to say, you know what, the GFS is the one that is, is correct, or the European model is the one that's correct. And they're gonna start using that model moving forward. So this is gonna be kind of the first test of which model is, is, is forecasting things correctly. Uh, but going back to the crop, Illinois is stressed, Indiana is stressed, Ohio is stressed. Uh, and these are the areas that are supposed to get some rain. So uh, it'll be very welcome if they receive it. Uh, but if not, if that uh, is uh, underperforming, we're gonna have some strength next week. Yeah. We'll keep an eye on the weather this weekend, see what happens on that front. Kind of an interesting story developing. Uh, you guys brought this up to me. Beans being shipped to Europe. What can you tell us on that front? Well, right now, it's kind of an interesting situation. We sold some beans to Spain earlier this week, and a lot of people are questioning why, because it was kind of an odd purchase. And what we're finding out right now, Bryce, is it's an economic situation. Uh, we are shipping beans over to Europe. Part of the problem is, you know, they need some meal. We're worried about excess supply of meal, but really what it is is an economic thing due to the rents. Uh, so as we're shipping the beans to, to essentially Spain, Spain's gonna crush them. They're gonna keep the meal, then they're either gonna ship the bean oil back or they're gonna convert the bean oil to renewable diesel and bring that back to the United States. But either way, it looks like either one of those products will essentially equate to a rent value, which is roughly $1.60 to $1.70. So that allows them to economically Believe it or not, ship beans there, bring no, or bean oil back or the essentially biodiesel back and make money. Yeah, it's an interesting storyline. Brian, is that something we've seen them do in the past? Slash, is that something you could expect moving forward as they kind of test the waters here? I don't think we've seen that in the past. Usually the story is, uh, you know, for beans doing some atypical movement would just be some years where you bring beans in from South America when they pencil into the East Coast. But as far as shipping beans somewhere else to crush them, to bring a product back to the U.S., this is the first I've heard of it. Uh, but this may be something that they do more of uh, if it makes economic sense before we get our own uh, additional crush facilities online. Uh, I think another interesting rumor today that we were hearing, and, and I don't know what the logic would be behind this or what's driving it, but that the U.S. may ban uh, cooking oils, use cooking oils uh, as a feedstock for the renewable diesel. Um, and so interestingly, if that is the case, what that would do is then put a lot more pressure on, uh, on soybean oil, sunflower oil, palm oil, any of these other vegetable oils. Um, so you think about a week ago, we had July soybean oil. Um, trading into the low 40s. I think we got down around like 44, 50-ish or so. Uh, then we settled today just above 54, 50. So that's a 10 cent move in soybean oil. Um, and so for your listeners, just so you can kind of get a sense of what that is uh, monetarily, uh, a 10 cent move in soybean oil in one contract is $6,000. So that would be like beans going up a buck 20. Uh, so this has been a very, very strong recovery over the last week in soybean oil values. Um, and it just makes that rumor make sense. I just don't know what the driver or the reason behind that policy would be. Yeah, you stole that question right from me. I guess you answered it before I can ask you what kind of motivation would be behind that, that kind of a ban. Well, guys, as we begin to wrap up today's conversation, we look at the trade next week. Of course, we're in a weather market, it seems like, at this point, watching the rainfall. But what else might be driving these markets higher or lower at this point moving forward? Right now, Bryce, I think it's going to be full weather near term, but then eventually I think you're going to have to, you know, 
assuming we start get the rain, eventually we're going to transition from a supply driven market. That's what this is, a weather scare. And then we're going to get reality into the demand side of the equation. And that's where our group, I think, is a little bit nervous about on the demand side of the equation. Um, you look what the government did. They cut exports by 50 million on today's report for old crop, but they've got new crop exports, something like 375 million bushel increase year on year. That could be a little bit stout. Feed usage revisions is quite high from year to year as well. So I think if we do get the crop to start stabilizing, we start getting this rain in the Midwest, we'll tr transition away from a supply driven market to a potential demand driven market. And if that happens, more than likely, we're probably gonna see prices go lower as they try to essentially entice some demand. Kind of on the row, row crop front. Before we let you go, though, Brian, you had mentioned uh, live cattle reversal toward the middle of the week. What did you, what'd you notice there? Yeah, we'll just touch on that real quick. The uh, live cattle futures had what you would call a key reversal on Wednesday. Uh, the textbook definition of that would be that the opening price uh, is not only above the previous session's price, but also a new contract high at the open. Uh, and then we settle below the previous day's low. Uh, so we did that in the October, December, February, April. Uh, so essentially your fall on out contracts. Um, the June contract did have a reversal, but it wouldn't be a, a textbook key reversal. Uh, and we did see the June and August contracts kind of hold support a little bit better than your fall on out to deferred. So, um, you know, the market has gone rather parabolic here in a short period of time. We put on a lot of value. Uh, we know this has uh, been a, a very steady bull market, but at some point you get the bullishness priced in. Uh, I don't know if this is the top, but it's definitely a signal worth watching. And if you're unprotected right now, maybe a reason to get some coverage to the downside. All right. Some good advice as we put a pause on today's conversation. That is Brian Split and Jim McCormick, both from Ag Market Net, our guests here on the weekly market updates. Of course, we're on to you in part by Nebraska Soybean Farmers and their checkoff.